Let's talk about the work you did on Wolfram physics, which was in rendering the hypergraph. So in the same way as you've got all these abstract spaces that you're plotting in three dimensions, the hypergraph of Wolfram physics is also an abstract space and we can plot it in any way we like. It basically consists of nodes, which are points, and edges, which are lines between those points. And to be able to visualize that, we want to be able to plot it on our two-dimensional screens or in three-dimensional space and project those onto our two-dimensional screens. So tell us about the, the basic way that you rendered the hypergraph before we get into the evolution over time. You've got a hypergraph. How do you show that on a screen? Okay, so you have a graph and to show it on the screen, you have to decide where the vertices are going to go. And to spread everything out, you need the vertices to be arranged so that you can see them distinct from one another. So you kind of need them spread out to not get clustered anywhere. And then you want points that are connected to edges to be close to each other. So you want everything to spread out except the neighbors be close. So just to be clear here, the way that we, we will lay these out in, in space is completely arbitrary but it makes more sense. Points of space that are connected to each other by an edge are effectively local to each other in space. So it makes sense that they're local to each other in the space in which you're rendering it on the screen. So the way to make points spread out is to treat them as charged particles and make them repel each other. And then the edges, you wanna keep those particles next to each other. So you have a restoring force. You model a spring there that maintains a close distance between neighbors. So effectively, you have electrostatic repulsion, according to Coulomb's law, pushing all of the nodes apart, and then attraction, according to the spring law, to Hooke's law, pulling them back together again, if they're connected by an edge. Yes, exactly. So you have springs and electrical forces. And so that's the spring electrical embedding. That's what it's called. And why do you think this spring electrical embedding produces such a pleasing graph, a graph that's good to look at? Right. Aesthetically, you need to, to have a, a graph which can communicate its structure to the eye. It has to be laid out in such a way so it's not confusing. So you need the individual elements not to line on top of each other, and you need everything to be spaced out, and you need neighbors to be close. So you're using spring electrical embedding to lay out a single frame of the hypergraph. But of course, when you apply rules to the hypergraph, it evolves over time. So tell us about the work you did that I'm really interested in, in how you laid out a graph that evolves over time. Right. So to model the evolution of a two-dimensional graph, the thing to do is to stack everything in layers. Just to be clear right from the start, each of those layers is a single step in the evolution of the hypergraph through time. Yes, correct. So here are the layers just stacked up. But the problem is with these individual frames is the whole structure of how the spring electrical embedding arranges each frame could be completely different from the others. So like vertices over here might change location in the next frame. So you want to not have that happen. Yeah, just for the aesthetics so that you can see how the universe is evolving without it like switching completely all over the place from frame to frame. Yeah. And the way to make sure that if a section of the graph that stays put in the next frame that the vertices that persist stay in the same place. Okay, so the way to do that is to take the total graph rewriting history and then stack them and then put each graph into its own coordinate layer in the Z direction. And then if a vertex is persistent, it, you know, doesn't get annihilated, survives from one frame to the next, in the next frame, you want that point to not move very much from where it was previously. So you can connect the vertex as it persists up the layer with a spring. So it's as though you confine each individual graph between two sheets of glass, basically. That's a great way of putting it. Right. And then you attach like these springs that, that keep persistent vertices in check. So effectively between each sheet of glass is one step of the hypergraph. And what you're doing is you're extending spring electrical embedding into that third dimension. So you've got a two dimensional hypergraph at each step, but you're yeah. making springs between the nodes in one step and the nodes in the next step while keeping them on this plane so that they remain in their own slice of time. Yeah, correct. How did that work out? Because, I mean, the, the ideal here is to get an animation which shows the evolution of the hypergraph over time. Yeah. So you run this spring electrical embedding for this 
augmented three-dimensional system where it's, uh, the evolution is plotted. And then I can go back and I can recover those layers and I can play them out here. So this is a two-dimensional updating with persistent vertices more or less in place. And yeah, so it doesn't jump around. It doesn't flip over or anything like that. It just works in a, in a very consistent way. Fantastic. And it's extensible to three-dimensional hypergraphs where the plotting is done in four dimensions, at least conceptually. I don't know if the graph embedding algorithm implemented in Wolfram currently is extensible. It's a four-dimensional construction. I don't know. I mean, it's something to ask Charles Pooh about. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is what I wanted <laughs> to arrive at here, because what you're doing here is you're plotting the hypergraph in two dimensions and then you're extending it into three-dimensional space where the third dimension is effectively time, the steps of the hypergraph as it's evolving Correct. over time. And so that gives you a two-dimensional animation. But what you're saying is that you could actually plot each step of the hypergraph in three dimensions and then extrude it into four-dimensional space where the fourth dimension is time, the evolution yeah. of the, the steps of the hypergraph over time. And then you would have a three-dimensional animation come out of that. Right. That's, that's nice and beautiful and, and consistent and doesn't jump around and does everything you want. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So this is why we need somebody like you who lives in four-dimensional space to plot the hypergraph. That's right. That's me. So that's fantastic. I really appreciate you taking us through how you rendered the hypergraph. I know there's a lot more that you've done in three-dimensional animation and cross-sections of four-dimensional spaces. So I'd love to see more of that in the future. Oh, yeah. If people want to find you, you can find Dugan on Twitter and you can find his YouTube channel, which have many more of his animations on it. So I'll post the links to those in the notes. Dugan, thank you so much for joining me on The Last Theory. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.